Great. Okay. We are actually, we actually have five minutes, but I'm going to um, invite Anna, if you are ready, to um, come in and come in a bit early so we can catch up a little bit. Okay, here I am. Great, not easy. Getting ready to go. A lot to say. The okay. speed. So I'm called on. Anna, indeed, as you've said. And I'm going to talk about mudlarking on a particularly low tide on a particular day on the Thames in central London. So mudlarking, as I'm sure most of you know, is when you, you go along and you scavenge the foreshore and you look for objects that have been lost or dropped over time in the mud. And because London's so old, you have like 2,000 years of history lying there. So you might find a Roman coin or you might find a sex toy chucked over the Millennium Bridge by a hen party. You just never know. The whole range in between. It's very exciting. And if you're a mud like you rely on the tides because the tidal reach of the Thames is huge. It's seven metres. It goes up and down twice a day. And it wears away very gently at the mud and it erodes the surface and these objects appear. And then you can go down and have a look. And if you're a mudlark, you rely on the tide tables. I get the tide table at the beginning of the year and go through and carefully mark um, everywhere. Oh, I forgot to see how much time I've got here. I carefully uh, mark um, when there's a particularly low tide. So for example, the last three days have been really, really low and I've been out uh, very, um, every morning. And um, you want that to be very low because you want to be able to go down there and see areas which are like virgin territory where no one's been for a long time and you might have wonderful artifacts exposed. So I thought I'd tell you about this one particular day. These are, these are some of my artifacts behind me, by the way. I built those shelves specially when I redid my house so I could display them. So on this particular day, it was February the 9th, and it was Storm Kiara, or Kira, depending on how you say it, which had hit England on that particular day. There were gusts of winds, I think up to 95 miles an hour. Unfortunately, 13 people died across Europe. It was a really, really big storm. And it wasn't a particularly low tide and the weather wasn't great as I've just described, but I thought I'll go down to the river anyway. It was quite early in the morning. And the tide went out to the point that it was meant to go. And then it um, uh, kept on going. It didn't stop. It went out further and further and further and further. And there's these wooden marks in the water that I always think of as the point beyond which the tide never goes. And actually, um, they, it went beyond that. It went two metres beyond that, and then you could wade out even further. So there was this huge area of foreshore suddenly exposed with all these treasures it was giving up. So the first thing that was really obvious were all the clay pipes. So I'm sure you know what clay pipes look like. They're here. I have about 500 of them, actually, that I've collected over time. That's some of them in this jar. Um, and there's so many of them because everybody smoked from about the six, early 1600s right till the First World War. Tobacco came in to England in about 1580. You can date the pipes by the size of the uh, clay pipe bowl. So that's a little tiny one, probably early 1600s. And they get, you know, as, they, as tobacco becomes cheaper and clay pipes more readily accessible like that, they become bigger. Anyway, I found 170 clay pipes on the foreshore that morning in one hour. I packed up half a plastic bag. I was beside myself with excitement. They were sort of bog standard, mainly Georgian, because this was an area with Georgian artifacts. Um, some of them have maker's marks. I really loved them. One had SV on it, which I liked. I researched it and it turned out to be for Smoke Virginia. So it was basically an early 17th century advert saying, take my clay pipe. We have the delicious Virginian tobacco that was imported from the Caribbean and not that rubbish that you get from native to America that's apparently very bitter. Um, there we go. I found that really interesting. The best pipe I found was this one. I'm going to show you. I pulled it out from between a couple of rocks like this. So look. It's so long, it's like crazy long. And it's amazing. It's such a rocky spot I found it in, and yet it had survived intact. So that was just marvellous. And it would have been longer. And of course, they were disposable. That's why you find them everywhere. You know, people smoke them, pass them around, broke off the end, they got a bit uh, blocked, they chuck them away. And you always find them where people congregate, a bit like uh, cigarette butts at bus, bus stops. So basically, the fag ends of yesteryear, that's how you think of them. That's how I think of them anyway. So the next thing is this. This, well, it doesn't look like much, actually, but I was thrilled by this bit of pottery. So it says here... Oh, the gout, as in the horrible 
uh, off them to complain in your foot and hear, drink and be well. And it turned out to be a 1750s bottle with a cure for gout made from water gathered from beneath a pear tree with withered fruit. I know this because I researched it. And apparently there was this pub landlord who decided to dig this well, drank the water, proclaimed it had cured his gout, and then marketed it to Londoners with this wonderful, with these two medallions on it. What I love, and you can't see it, was in the whole one that I saw online, is in this one it's got crutches, and in that one it's thrown the crutches away. So it's like a proper miracle cure. And I love that it really connects you to people in the past when you realise, you know, they... They can be so they can be so quack cures just as easily as we still can. And here's another one. It doesn't look that exciting, but it is. It's a little tiny perfect late 1600s, early 1700s apothecary pot. So if you were of the middling class, because if you were poor, you couldn't have afforded this. You basically have to go to someone called a cunning man or woman who's like a witch doctor and have a spell. If you were a middling class person, you'd go to the apothecary and get a potion. And it would be put in a little tin glaze Delfware pot like this. Bit of uh, material put over the top and tied with string. I, I researched some of the stuff that goes in these pots. It's great. So, for example, if you had a bruise, you might get some lion fat, uh, some sparrow brain, and a bit of dried up mummy from Egypt, which I find brilliant. It's called mamiya. Apparently, everybody wanted mamiya in their potions. <laughs> And I think that's really interesting because it really connects you to the, to, the, to the mindset of people 350 years ago. You know, if you're a middle class person, you knew Egypt existed. You knew they had tombs. You knew there were dead bodies there. I mean, I find that really interesting. And it makes me realize that they were much more cosmopolitan than they imagined. Basically, mudlarking is a way for me to try and connect with people in the past. Otherwise, I think of them as shadows on the wall rather than real people. And I connect with people through their idiosyncrasies, as one does in life anyway. And so I love this, and I think that's rather, rather brilliant. But by the way, this pot is called Tin Glaze, and I've recently discovered that it was the first white glaze to come to England, and everyone was thrilled, because before that, the only way to get white was to buy really, really expensive Chinese import, and only the really aristocratic could afford that. So that was like a poor man's version of the Chinese um, pottery. I think I've got time. I'm not sure what's going on here. I love this. It looks like a mini dog bone. These are quite hard to come by. I've got two. Been mudlarking for six years. Only found two. Found lots of halves. And it is, as I'm sure you all know, <laughs> a wig curler. So this could be any time from 1650 to the end of the 18th century. So basically what happened was Charles II went to exile in France and everyone was wearing great wigs there. And he came back with wigs. And of course, all the aristocracy copied him. And they all had these magnificent curling wigs, which they had to look after. And the way you looked after it was you would wind the hair around a heated roller like this, and then you would set the curls. You could even actually wind it when it was cold and then put the whole lot, whole wig into a cake, uh, like a baking pot and cover it with pastry and put it in the oven, take it to the bakers and then set the curls that way. And then once you'd actually got the yeah, wig back on your head, if you, were, collection. If, you were, if you were wealthy and you had a, a valet, you could um, get your valet to spurt um, with, a, with a, like a, I forgot what they're called, it puffs air, um, a pumping thing to puff air. My words have escaped me. Anyway, it puffed white powder over your hair. And then you'd also put in a load of pomade and perfumes. So you'd be quite stinky and quite sticky. And actually added about a pound of weight to their head. And these, these wigs were going on for about 150 years, which is, which is extraordinary, really. And by the time we got to the end of the um, 18th century, they were sort of pathetic little barrister-like things, and they were only the oldest fuddy-duddy would wear them. But I'm fascinated by them. Also, Samuel Pepys um, was really worried that his wig might be sourced from a plague victim. I'm not sure it's because he didn't want dead people's hair or he was worried it'd be infectious. And also, he had to take it to his... Um, wig maker to get the lice removed at one point. Oh, that, that was um, apparently a problem. Although a lot of men would shave their hair and then put the wig on top and that would stop them getting lice. And also it'd cover up their syphilitic sores on their head. And I always imagine a young bride going to her on her honeymoon and the man removing his wig for the first time and revealing this sort of horrible, so completely bald head covered in syphilitic scars. Anyway, that's a jolly little thought. So those are my Finds. I'm not sure how much time I've got left. I, if I had, 
you can have um, <clears throat> a, a minute. How's a minute? Oh, a minute. Well, I'll just show you these. Obsession. I'm getting overexcited here. So this is my obsession. You can't really see what it is. They're pins. Now, each oh. one of these has been handmade. I've got 15,000 of them picked up over six years, which I'd say is like a reasonable obsession. Slightly nutty. I love them because, like so many of these objects, they tell you everything about life. You can tell the history of England through pins, really, or at least from 1400 when they started being manufactured. They were made by people in their houses, you know, the poor little kids with their eyes being strained. But, you know, there were trade wars over these pins, and Adam Smith used them to show teach about the division of labour, and Queen Elizabeth had a royal pinner, and 40,000 pins delivered every six months, and farthingales were kept together with them, and sleeves were held together, and papers were pinned together, and Elizabethan ruffs had hundreds of them in them. And I just find it completely fascinating that these pins that were even bequeathed in wills, they were that important, <laughs> um, are now, like, literally... Nothing. You know, you can survive without a pin. I think the only thing I use a pin for is to heat the end and try and gouge out the old splinter. And that is it. And these are all over my house. We tread on them all the time. My children say, Mummy, I'm short on a chewed a pin, which is like <laughs> I think many houses say that. Anyway, that's what I found on this particular low tide. And I've become really attuned to the tides. I love the tides. I check the tide table every day. And personally, I just find the whole thing miraculous. And oh, I just to say, you can, um, I, I do uh, keep my finds. I photograph my finds and I put them on Instagram and I write about them as well. So if you want to see more of them, it's uh, Foreshore Seashore on hey. Instagram. Fantastic. Thank you, Anna. That was wonderful. Um, we, we've had a couple of hands up. Uh, we've, lost, we've lost one. Uh, we have one hand up. Um, so before we come back to see if anybody has a question for Anna, Pete, I'm just going to go to you um, and you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, two, two things. Can you hear me? Is that yes. good? Yeah, yeah. Two things. One was um, Extinction Rebellion, one of those the, the songs that I've been singing a lot over the last last year. People gonna rise like the water, turn this system round in the voice of my great granddaughter. Climate justice now, yeah. and the people gonna rise like the water. It's just a beautiful yeah. mantra of a song that's happening. Happened on, on a lot of demonstrations and then the other thing was the song that I've been asking for lyrics we haven't had an accordion have you had an accordion yet today oh yeah no not oh, yet. yeah well you're just gonna have just the briefest taste of accordion um, I've been collecting lyrics from people today um, for a Morecambe Bay song it goes uh, you can see the this these are all your lyrics you can see the weather coming in when you live by the side of the sea the waves are waving can't you see when you live by the side of the sea watch the sun travel across the sky when you live by the side of the sea that's the sea that's waving to you and me can you live by the side of the sea so add some put some lyrics in the track i've got uh i've got three verses from you so far and that was one of them and i'll be singing them in about half an hour so that was me thanks a lot You've got half an hour to uh yeah. to send you lyrics. Could gather some more words okay anybody would anybody like to quickly uh, just pick up with Anna before we go to Steve. Any 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 questions or comments for the wonderful mudlarker? I've got I've got oh, just run like. Can you give me top tips for mudlarking in like thirty seconds? <laughs> um, perseverance. Yeah. And get down low. Get down. That's what I'd say. <laughs> And get muddy. Perseverance. Don't expect to find magical things. I, don't, I mean, you can always just be happy with the fact that the day is lovely and yeah. that um, I think, yeah, that's what I'd say. Perseverance and get down low are the best two tips I can give you. So I think if you, people often just, I often stand up and think, why aren't I finding anything? And I literally get down extremely low and then I can suddenly see. And then, you find, then you find 300 pipes. 
then you find 300 pins, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you learn, after a while, you learn shapes, you can see things. So like even the, the side of a light, what looks like a tiny sliver of white, you know that beneath it, there's a pipe, but you have to learn those things over time. I think that, yeah, it's a slowly accumulated knowledge over time, which is for me is what made it pleasurable. And I think if you keep persevering and keep going, you'll keep seeing things. Thank you, Anna. Getting wonderful. your eye in, is that's what, what people say. Yeah. Get your yeah. Eye in. yeah, great, wonderful. We're going to move on to Steve McPherson, who should be ready to join us, I believe. Hello. Here he is. How you doing? Good, we can hear you, see you, all is good. Excellent. Well, I'm just going to go straight in and uh, share my screen. Uh, just so we can um, find out what I've been doing. So um, I live on oh, I live on the uh, North Kent coast uh, near Margate. Um, I don't live in New Haven, which was um, on the website. But there you go. Um, and as you can see, I'm um, nearer France, and I am um, actually nearer France. I am London. And I beach comb and I've lived in this um, area for nearly all of my life. And um, ever since I was a child, I've gone to uh, the beaches around here and collected um, objects that interested me. This is the main beach that I collect from. And I call this an urban beach because as you can see, the um, houses and their gardens and the roads go right up to it. Uh, this is a very small beach, 160 meters across, and it's called um, Epple Bay uh, near Birchington on sea. And um, I grew up um, along the uh, road to the um, left um, being able to see the sea from uh, my bedroom window and hear it and go to sleep to it. And I spent hours and hours on this beach um, with my friends and on my own collecting things and um, exploring. And um, really uh, the sea and, you know, in the marine environment has saturated uh, my life and um, and I didn't tell you, but I'm an artist and um, it saturated most of my artworks. This is um, a view from that little urban beach uh, when the tide um, is out. Not, it's not completely out on this beach. It's, um, it goes out further. And um, here you can see there's um, it's chalk cliffs and these are chalk reefs. And we're one of the only places around here uh, in Kent that has uh, these chalk reefs. And it's a site of special scientific interest because of that. And because of the algae and the seaweeds that, um, that grow in the area. Uh, you also find um, on this beach, amazing fossils. There are some fossils um, of sea urchins here that I have been told that you don't find anywhere else which are sort of 40 million years old or so. There's always ships on the horizon and these tankers and cargo ships are always going either towards London or out from Essex and London, out towards the rest of the world. And I, and I think that's partly why I'm so passionate and so kind of um, obsessed with the sea is because every time I stand on the beach, you know, on the tide line i feel like i'm connected with the rest of the world you know the horizon doesn't just go five miles out the horizon goes beyond that and connects me with all the other people who are um, on their horizons so um i've been collecting all kinds of things off this beach for many years um from uh gas masks, Second World War gas masks, to, um, as I said before, fossils, uh, musket balls, um, amber, and um, I've got some amber here. Uh, I don't know whether you'll be able to see that these are, these are pieces of amber that we find. So we know in this area that the currents are bringing lots of different stuff down from the, obviously the Baltic Sea, this is Baltic Amber, from the Baltic Sea, so from, you know, the, uh, from Norway, from uh, Northern Europe coasts, and, um, and along with that is lots of plastic. And this is also something which is a bit like plastic, 
But this comes this is uh, comes from uh, much more locally um, than that. And this is cordite. This is out of uh, munitions from either the First or Second World War from uh, um, ships that have sunk and uh, munitions that have um, gone into the sea. And then the bombs have disintegrated and just left these bits of uh, plastic explosives, really. And as a teenager, this was great fun to pick up and make little our own personal fireworks out of. I don't do it anymore. <laughs> Um, so this, this beach is full of history, the smugglers' um, caves and smugglers' tunnels. And we're on a beach, we're, I'm in a, a, a place called the Isle of Thanet, which used to be an island, and it's where Christianity first came over to um, the UK. The Romans um, brought Christianity uh, into the UK a couple of uh, miles away from me, when it was still an island, um, this little Isle of Thanet, which is on the end of Kent. So that's a view from the other side, and you can see that the, um, the because of the chalk cliffs, the uh, whole beach, nearly the whole beach and the whole area is curtained by this um, concrete promenade. And that has to be there, otherwise the um, cliffs end up falling in every year um, because of the ice and the frost getting into the chalk, the saturated chalk. Um, it, it is a very, it's a, it's a boring beach to most people, this beach. You know, it's, um, like I said, it's, it's an urban beach. It's not a beach that many people go to in the summer. There's lots of tourist beaches near here. It's a beach that doesn't get cleaned very often because the tourists don't go here. Um, so the council don't bother cleaning it. But I've been picking up stuff off this beach for over 25 years, and, and that's mainly plastic, really. And here you can see this is where we have uh, lots of the seaweed on the beach and all those footprints are my footprints when I'm going around picking up plastic to use in my artwork. And so um, like I've been using plastic in my artwork for over 25 years, but I became really obsessed with it as a material in 2007 and really started focusing it on plastic pollution on these beaches that I go to um, uh, near my home um, as my main material. And this is some of the photographs of some of the objects, the recognisable objects that you might find on the beach um, here. You might find these on, on beaches all over the world, you know, and um, it's quite amazing what you can find. So um, we're actually down from um, the mudlarking scene, the Thames, we're right, literally right on the end of the Thames, the end of the Thames estuary. Um, and there's a, some dispute of whether, whether we are part of the Thames estuary or whether we're the North Sea, but we're right on that edge. So a lot of plastic that comes down the Thames will come over to um, down onto uh, my little beach that I collect mainly from. And I started documenting these um, objects uh, uh, photographically in um, 2009-2010 because um, I exhibited some work and I had an argument with a, a, one of the gallery uh, visitors who who suggested that I just went to shops and bought plastic toys and then put it in a washing machine to make it look old. Um, so I thought, you know, uh, no, I've got, to, I've got to start documenting it actually where it is. Um, and then um, at the moment, I've got over 3,000 uh, photographs of um, plastic pollution in situ on the beaches. And uh, this um, installation here of this photographic artwork, um, which is called An Undesirable Archive, is the largest one um, that I've done so far. And um, this, is, this was in 2020 at the University of Wisconsin in Eau Claire. So um, th this um, artwork has gone, um, it's been exhibited around the world in many different places and, and continues to um, be shown. Steve, These are the main pieces Steve, that you... Sorry to interrupt, I'm just going to give you two minutes. Okay, these are the main pieces of kind of uh, plastic that I find, and you know, these are what I call shards. Um, and I collect them and sort them into different colours, which is difficult for me because I'm actually colourblind. And then um, I put them together to create artworks, which are um, uh, ensemblage, um, collage, if you want to call it, of um, one colours or types. I also do infographics. This is an infographic piece which describes the um, the the uh, depth and the area of the uh, five main oceans of the world. Uh, this one has been exhibited all over the world as well. It's currently in New York. And um, 
you can see all these different types of artworks on my website if you want to if you want to have a look at it, uh, look at it if you just t type my name to google um and um it will usually come up recently i've been collecting fabrics off the beaches as well and creating little sculptures out of these which were much more like archaeological objects and this is what i like about these objects that i find they are archaeological they are the archaeology of the 21st century and they describe stories and tell stories about the world and about the 21st century and our love and our obsession with plastic objects there you go okay <laughs> fantastic yeah thank you very much that's yeah, great uh, that's usually that's usually a 40 minute um talk yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, we're in the business of romping and so we've, we've romped through so many ideas and so much work in the last 12 10 hours 12 11 hours so absolutely it's wonderful uh thank you very much for sharing that no um, problem I'm going to invite susan to come in now hello hi hello susan hi <laughs> hello everybody um i don't know if i'm if i'm okay in this this setting yeah we're absolutely fine and oh great okay um, I'm not going to talk for very long because I'd like to show a um, like to screen share and show a, a short section of um, images of uh, tide pools, a series of rock pools that I came across about 10 years ago. And um, I found them kind of quite tr tricky to work with photographically. So I ended up bringing um, thanks to the marine biology departments at the University of Plymouth, I, I ended up bringing um, the, some of the creatures, the, the inhabitants of the rock pools and the seaweeds to my studio and kept them alive for a short period of time to work with them and then transported them back to where they, they came from. And I was photographing them from, from the underside of a big glass tank. And... Um, in a way, the works are kind of homage homage to um, to those very fragile, but they're extraordinarily rich, biodiverse um, collection of pools up on the North Devon coast near Speaks Mill Bay and round the corner towards Ilfracombe at Lee Bay. Um, they they look like um, because of the kind of coralline lining of the pools, they look like small paintings sitting on the grey rocks on the on the shoreline. Um, there's a kind of also homage to um, Anna Atkins, and we've seen quite a few images of seaweeds and references to Anna Atkins, and she's a, a huge kind of figure, but there's a kind of underside to her work, which is a sort of Victorian plundering of the, the shoreline and a kind of real decreasing of the biodiversity of the areas where that fascination was kind of coming into um, into being in the Victorian era. And so I, I asked a, a poet, um, John Wedgwood Clark, to work with me on a small book. And he's written some beautiful poems, which I'm going to um, play now that work with the images. And I think they, they kind of bring out the um, uh, something of that sort of context of fragile life and our kind of um, inseparability from it, um, you know, good and bad, and um, referencing that era, but it reflects on the present as well. And um, anyway, I'm just going to go ahead and share the screen and see, see where we get. Um, Not getting anywhere at the moment. Oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah, we've got that. That's good. Okay. Close, um, close your Zoom window. Yeah, there you go. That's it. Okay. Um, here we go. Am I rippled by light or rippling light above the limpet's apparent certainty? Am 
I give you license to gaze, to make what you can't of this light in your eyes. The algae crowded light, vast shoals of vacancy, sailing strangely into it. You might name this Nova Albion, with a sixpence of brass plaque and your diseases, but I am no oak. There are no white cliffs. Naked ink, pilgrim ink, my soul doth yawn light. Now dance, blue lover, blue nebula I'm falling into. I hear your body carried to me on the wind through the halls of waves. You have made a portrait that is more me than me, floating to the ceiling, my stipe at the golden section. There I unpeel the sepia history of antique rose, in silks, in wallpaper, laminations, cracks. A florilegium of silences, tied by a fine green ribbon. My candelabra of voices burns outside your door. What do you propose to do with my likeness in your great houses, drawing rooms, shop windows, songs, blue hands? I left this impression long ago and continue elsewhere. Light comes, goes everywhere an unchaste cellular rush. You have tossed me from the background of your life, a lock of hair, lock of light. I am all your past in a body taking flight. Sun through a snow cloud, you cannot press for your album the transparency of childhood looking. I have made room for you yet again. Come in, the limpets are in full watercolour. No one is watching. You need perform your looking for no one. A mid-afternoon dream in which you are waiting for someone to speak, original light. Okay, that's that's it. Thank you. That was gorgeous. <laughs> we there are some there's nice feedback in the chat window which you can look at. We in order to um, stay on track, I'm going to move on, Susan. But thank you for those. I'm okay. sure some people would love to know more about how they're made, um, and perhaps they can find that some information on your website. <laughs> Um, yeah, the website's down at the moment, but oh, the um, uh, <laughs> um, there's a there's a um, Instagram page, and um, you know that's that's good. Susan Dare just on Instagram is good, or Birdie Hicks Gallery is good. Great, wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us, and thank you for sharing that gorgeous work with us. Uh, and we're going to move on now to Sophie. Sophie Ward. There she is. Hi. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Richard. Hey, welcome. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'd like to start by saying thank you for having me. Um, an amazing event. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a scientist. I'm an ocean scientist at Bangor University. And as a scientist, what I'm presenting today or talking about today might be quite different to the rest of the day, but also this style is somewhat different to what I'm used to. I'm used to standing up with um, PowerPoint slides. And what I've decided to do is today, totally freestyle. So some of you have been on the screen for 11 hours. So I thought, close your eyes, <laughs> take your eyes off the screen. Or for those of you who'd like to, you know, feel free. But I'm not going to put up any visuals. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about some tidal fundamentals and the history of the tides and the importance of the tides in our climate system. 
So to start with, as I said, I'm an oceanographer. My expertise is in using ocean models, computer models of the seas to simulate how the oceans flow, how the, in particular the shelf seas. I look a lot at the Northwest European continental, continental shelf seas. And I apply these models to a range of research topics. But what I'm presenting today is kind of tidal fundamentals and some of the work, or most all of the work, um, is not mine. But I hope you'll agree that it's an interesting story. So in case you do switch off mentally um, or audibly and visually, I'd like to um, tell you three key facts today for this talk. So um, in non-classical storytelling way, I'm total spoiler alert on the key take home facts are coming up now. So number one, I'd like you to think of the Earth and the Moon as one system. We have an Earth-Moon system. The Moon is not separate to the Earth, it is one whole system. The age of the Moon is about four and a half billion years old. That's fact number two. And fact number three is that the Moon is moving away from the Earth, and that is because of the tides. So I will explain a bit about why that is going forward in the next few minutes. The next thing I'd like to talk to you about is what's called the, a, the moon age paradox. So there's somewhat of a mystery surrounding the age of the moon. So we know that it's around four and a half billion years old, and that's been dated thanks to the Apollo 11 mission. In 1969, what they did is they brought back some rock samples from the moon. They've had those dated, and the moon is about four and a half billion years old. Now, the moon is moving away from the Earth at a rate of about four centimetres a year. Now, had the moon been doing that for four and a half billion years old, uh, for four and a half billion years, it's absolutely impossible. The, the rate at which it's moving away from the Earth, if it had always been the same, would make the moon one and a half billion years old. So the age of the moon and the rate at which it's moving away from the Earth don't match up. There's somewhat of a mystery there. And scientists have recently been addressing that mystery. And computer models and ocean models have helped to address that um, mystery. So some tidal fundamentals very quickly. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, the tides are a periodic rise and fall of our oceans. Um, around here or around the UK, we have semi-diurnal tides, which means our waters rise and fall twice a day. And that semi-diurnal signal is forced fundamentally or dominantly by the moon. The sun is also an important part of the tidal system or tidal forcing, but as are other bodies and rotating forces. But in this context, the moon is the dominant force. And the tide, what it does, the moon exerts a gravitational pull on the waters of the Earth. And as the moon passes those waters, the waters are pulled towards the moon and that place that's nearest the moon at any time will experience a high tide. Or well, there's a bit of a phase lag and, and that varies around the world, but essentially that is what happens. And the tide, that, that tide, as we rotate within that bulge, the tidal signal moves around the coasts and the tide propagates as a long, a very long wavelength wave all around our coastal oceans. And there are even tides actually in, there are perceptible tides in some lakes as well. They can be so large that that um, signal can be picked up in lakes. So the tide is very energetic. A lot of energy is pumped into the system from the gravitational pull of the moon, but also from the sun. And there's so much energy in the system that that energy is lost. And now that energy is lost in a number of ways, but most of that energy is lost a, through mixing. So mixing in the deep ocean, the tide contributes to a lot of um, internal mixing and mixing of deep waters up to the surface. But also what happens is as the tides flow from the deep oceans onto the shelf seas, as the water gets shallower, a lot of that um, tidal energy is lost in what we call dissipation. So the energy is dissipated. It's just a frictional effect with the seabed. And as the tide loses energy through this frictional effect, what happens is the earth that's rotating within the tide is slowing down. That the, the frictional force of those of, of the tide is essentially putting a break on the rotating of the earth. And one day the earth will end up, it will stop rotating. Uh, that's a long way away, no need to worry. Um, so that's a frictional effect that the, the, um, the, that's how the 
massive energy of the tide is dissipated. So the a lot of that energy as well, I just wanted to say as well, um, reiterate the importance of the tide in our climate system. So I just mentioned this mixing in the deep ocean, but the tide obviously contributes to um, massive tidal currents around the coast. Uh, lots of things that live within the oceans are dependent upon tidal currents, but also the intertidal region. And we've seen a lot of that, the salt flats and, um, and marshlands. We've seen a lot of that today. So the tides are fundamental to our climate system as a whole. So the tidal energy, um, I just want to go back to um, deep tide. Um, so deep time, sorry, I'm just looking at <laughs> Marie's comment. Stop commenting, it's distracting me. <laughs> okay, on my freestyle. Um, so those are the tides today. And I want to go back in time now to tell you a bit about what the tides were doing before, because that will help us to understand this moon age paradox. So what a colleague of mine has been doing, Matthias Green, he's Professor Matthias Green at Bangor University, He's been simulating, so computer modeling the tides millions of years ago. He's now gone back 700 million years with these computer models. And what happened millions of years ago is that the continents were in a very different formation to what they are today. Um, we have supercontinent cycles and they last about 450 million years. We are currently about 180 million years into our current supercontinent cycle. So about 180 million years ago, the latest supercontinent broke up. All of our continents were together in what was known as Pangaea, that formation. And since then, 180 million years ago, um, Pangaea has been splitting up uh, for reference Dinosaurs started roaming about 200 million years ago and became extinct about 65 million years ago. I live in Snowdonia, that formed about 320 million years ago, so way before Pangaea. So we're in the supercon as the supercontinents were all together were the massive deep oceans and far fewer shell seas. And the tides were a lot lower than what they are today. So lower tides equals less energy to be dissipated, less energy lost, less energy applied to the breaking force of this rotating Earth. And as the breaking force of the rotating Earth happens, what happens is it pushes the moon away from us, much like if you were sitting on um, um, a roundabout in, and you flung, you flung your arm out, it would slow you down. It's kind of the inverse of that, where if this force here slows down, it flings out the moon. So lower tides equals less breaking of the earth and less shoving away of the moon. So in the past, the moon was actually moving away from the earth far slower than it is today. And by adding up what, what the tides have done and the amount of energy that's been dissipated within the earth moon system helps to explain the rate at which the moon has been moving away from the earth in the history of time. So Matthias has also been looking at deep time into the future. And what he has been finding or um, what it looks like a potential formation of the supercontinent, the next supercontinent might be by the current tectonic drift. So our, the average annual tectonic drift is about six centimeters a year in, on the globe at the moment. So in about 250 million years, perhaps, we'll have our next supercontinent and over the whole of that time, it looks like the tides will be less than what they are today, about 85% of what they are today. And that's the moon signal of the tide, which is the dominant signal. Obviously, there are, there's the sun and other things that add up to it, but certainly the moon is the dominant signal. Um, so the tides are a really important, of our, important part of our climate system. Um, what I wanted to say is the tides at the moment are massive. They're massive because of resonance. So much like in a bathtub, if you think of a bathtub and you slosh water around in a bathtub, um, if you slosh that water around at the right frequency, you get really high tides. And that's exactly what's happening at the moment. In particular, the North Atlantic is within a resonant state. But if we go back even 20,000 years, about 20,000 years was the last glacial maximum. Our sea levels around the world, on average, about 130 meters lower than they are today. And um, the North Atlantic was at resonance. So massive tides were sloshing around in that basin. We had the biggest tides within the whole of the 450 million year supercontinent cycle. 
And today, the tides are less than they were during the last glacial maximum. And going forwards, the um, certainly the the um, the moon's tide, semi-diurnal tidal signal will likely be less than what is today. So we're at a really exciting and important part of the tidal cycle or the long-term deep time tidal cycle. Sophie, I don't want to interrupt you mid-wonderful flow. I'm going to two more minutes. Okay, great. I just wanted to summarise the importance of the tide. So the tides are really important for our climate. Um, and also what I'd like to say on this is that there is a theory that the tides were what were the tides were fundamental to the evolution of life, if you like, because um, or the, certainly the evolution of walking vertebrates. So, around 400 million years ago, there were thought to be about four meter tides around the world. And what happened was every two weeks, um, fish were getting stranded up in high rock pools, and then every two and then only two weeks later would those rock pools then wet again. And so it was the strongest fish with the strongest fins that could get back to the water. Uh, the main sea that we're able to survive. And so there's a theory that the tides are actually, well, in fact, we owe the tides our lives. Fabulous. Fantastic. Okay, it was actually really good to have that barrage of information without any graphics. It was really nice because you know, you, I think you absorb it in a completely different way than you know when you're looking at a, a standard PowerPoint. So Wonderful. I think we'll we'll all be dreaming a bit about that tonight and trying to work through it. Did she answer Hugh's question? Yeah. When will the Earth stop turning? I mean, just rest assured, Brexit will be the least of our worries by then. It'll be millions of years hence. <laughs> Billions. <laughs> Brexit will probably still be one of our worries many millions of years from now. <laughs> Sorry, let's not get political on the side. that direction now. <laughs> so what happens when the world, when the Earth stops turning? Do we all fall off? Pass. <laughs> What about the what about the poles flipping though? Because that seems like that's a much more uh, imminent event from what one reads. The poles flipping. I know nothing about that. Yeah. Okay. Well, now there's a bit of because that's going to affect the tides. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, good. Wonderful. We'll have nice warm water, won't we? We'll be in the southern hemisphere. Yeah. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. That was brilliant. Okay. Um, and we are going to Andy, uh, who is hopefully going to show us a video he's made because we haven't really had proper time to upload it properly. So with luck, it's going to show fine from his wonderful house. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 it, my, uh, my computer's rubbish for streaming videos. Okay. So um, so I've got a link to it, which Great. I'll, okay, I'll that's stick fine. in the chat box. <laughs> Um, so, Richard, um, Richard, um, Richard, am I coming in after Andy then? Pete, I'm really sorry, I skipped one. Uh, yes, I'll bring you in after Andy. Sorry. Okay, I, I, then I because I've got something on after that. Okay, so I'll let. Okay. Are you okay, or do you need? Do we need to? Yeah, no, that's that's um, no, that's are you okay, Hugh, to wait for a bit? Yep. Yeah, okay. Cool. Sorry, Andy. Go ahead. My fault. No worries. Um, so uh, my name is Andy Thatcher. Um, I'm a filmmaker, photographer, writer. I do all sorts of bits and pieces. Um, I'm going to be starting a PhD um, in film in September of this year, looking at registered commons. So place is kind of the thing that really interests me. Um, I've lived in Exeter since 2008, um, and I've been exploring and filming and photographing the area around the M5 bridge um, for about the last five years I'm quite obsessed with the area um I first started becoming interested in it when I ran underneath the, the M5 bridge along the, the canal um notice it does really interesting things around about sunset you got all kinds of weird patterns and things so um eventually I stopped running around there and I started walking and um yeah it's uh 
it's it's a fascinating thing it's got a quite a beautiful curve to it the the concrete picks up the colors of the sky really strangely um and you get these patterns and whenever you go it's different um you know whatever time of year the plants are different um the animals are different you've got you know um you know you've got you've got flocks of seagulls flying around it or pigeons nesting in it um i was even under it for the past eclipse that we had a few years ago which was very exciting um and of course, one of the big things that really changes it is the tide. So if you're on the, the side with the uh, the canal, then all that happens is that the tide comes through the reeds, um, which looks rather nice. But if you're on the Topsham side, um, then it's much more dramatic. So um, I've, uh, I've spent the day making a film. Um, I've never made a film in a day before. I mean, I started shooting at about quarter past eight and finished editing at quarter past six and in between time sort of going walking and all sorts of bits and pieces. And of course I had technical problems. Um, That's half the course. Um, I, the stabiliser on my camera um, didn't work properly for some reason. Um, so um, if you suffer from seasickness, maybe you need to st- sit back a little bit from, uh, from the video. Um, so what else was I going to say? Um, I think that's that's probably it. Um, yeah, I'm going to uh, stick a link to my video in the chat box. Um, it's just over five minutes long. Um, so let me know when you're finished. So there's the link.
Okay, so everyone had a chance to uh, to to listen to that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 I feel like we're getting to know that uh, particular tidal basin really well. <laughs> We've had all kinds of explorations of it. That was an amazing feat, Andy, to put that together. Thank you. Day. Well done. I, th I think one of the things which, because I because I, I live in Exeter, um, and I just assumed that I'd do Topsham. Um, and then when I, I went down to Riverside Valley Park, which is just inside Exeter, um, I discovered that the whole of the area had been flooded. Um, and uh, I just discounted filming the, the flooding there. So I thought it would be so much more interesting further up the estuary. But I was completely wrong. Um, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, there were dogs splashing around in, in, in the water and, you know, people having to turn around and, and not complete the walk the way that they wanted to. And people were chatting about it. So it was, uh, you know, it was really interesting. I, th I think, you know, if, if I was to do this again, then I would actually focus on Exeter because although it's, it's a bit more subtle and a bit less dramatic, it's nevertheless interesting, certainly in terms of what people are doing. So uh, that, was, that was sort of one of the, one of the things I learned. Excellent. No, no. <laughs> well, right. Thank you, Andy. That was great. And, um, and um, I apologise for bringing you in early. And I apologise to Pete for skipping you. That was terrible. I think my eyes are going. Um, so we're going to head over to Pete now. And Hugh, I believe. Yeah, I think he's going to join me. So can you hear me OK? Is that, is that volume on that OK? Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. No worries about, no, I can, I've done 24 hour things in the past and I know what happens to your brain as you, as you kind of the morass of stuff goes past you. It's amazing. It's been fantastic. It's been lovely. Andy, that was just beautiful. Um, um, it's funny. I, I would have, I had a song that I was going to sing after the previous speaker, but it doesn't feel that it's the right song to finish, <laughs> to, to go here. So I'm going to, this is, I'm going to, I am in up, up here in Morecambe, Morecambe Bay. Um, and I've been, I've lived in Morecambe Bay over since 1981, round in Ulverston, then Barrow, and then I've come back here and I live in Morecambe now. And um, it's an amazing bay. It's just the, 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 the energy of the sea and the views that you get and the changing mud and everything is quite extraordinary. And um, a little while ago, a few years ago, I came across a guy called Marcus Faget who had this project called the Tide and Time Bell that he was doing. And he put a set of these bells in different places around the country. And um, I met him and I said, yeah, come, and make, come and bring one to Morecambe Bay. And so we fundraised and with Morecambe Artists Colony, which is a group of artists who live here, we raised the money and we put together the, the, the whole project. And now there's a bay. I, I was um, playing it earlier on in the day. I'll, I'll put the link to the film in the chat in, in a bit. But inevitably, as a songwriter, I wrote a song for this. Um, for I think it was for an opening, maybe it was for the opening of the bell. Probably was. It's time to ring the tidal bell. See the waves rise and fall. Hear the gulls cry their call. It's time to ring the tidal bell. A high tide, low tide, changing strangely year by year. A high tide, low tide, climate change fills us with fear. They ring the coast from north to south, see the bells rise and fall, hear the bells, hear their call. A high tide, low tide, changing strangely year by year. Low tide, high tide, climate change fills us with fear.
free your microphone's a little hot. A little loud or a little low? Loud. Yeah, a little loud. A little loud, okay. It might also be the accordion, might be a bit... Well, yes, it, it probably was the accordion. <laughs> So how, so I'm going to sing a song with the piano now. So let's just yeah. if, so just give us a. Um, yeah, that's good. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. So Hugh, I've known Hugh for many many years, um, and um, we've played music and sung. And so he's down in the southwest. I'm up in the northwest. This is a tune we've never played together before, but he's going to join me, I believe, and it's. Um, was part of a song cycle about the birds of Morecambe Bay, um, written with a great um, poet called Boris Howarth. Sounded nice. Did like was that nice for people? Yes. Yeah, it was lovely. Yeah. So this is a song that that's kind of been created during the day with people, but the story of it is um, 
is, has a longer genesis. So in 2004, as you'll remember, there was a, a tragedy in Morecambe Bay when a whole group of Chinese migrant laborers were caught by the tide in the middle of the night and got sucked into the quicksand and died. And I live, if you look outside my window, that's what I see. I saw the helicopters, we saw the, um, saw it all happening. And um, it, um, as a musician living and working in this community, we then started to work with our Chinese community. We started to think about all of the issues about social migration, economic migration, all of that stuff, and made a piece called The Long Walk, which we we wrote with your local people and performed here. And we did it again, actually in Gateshead with Chinese communities there in Liverpool, and then in Hong Kong. And I've been traveling to Hong Kong for 15, 16 years now, developing community music projects as a result of that tragedy. Um, one of the songs that Lem Sisse, who was the poet who worked with us on the project, um, we wrote this one day, it was basically a very, very simple. It's in D minor. Um, you can all sing the refrain, because the refrain goes, when you live by the side of the sea. So these were some of our words. You get cold, you get wet, you get full of sand when you live by the side of the sea. You can swim in the waves, fish for fish when you live by the side of the sea. You can search fish, fish for free when you live by the side of the sea. You can build sand castles, paddle and surf when you live by the side of the sea. Here was one of your verses. See the weather, weather coming in when you live by the side of the sea. The waves are waving, can't you see when you live by the side of the sea? Watch the sun travel across the sky when you live by the side of the sea. That's the sea, the sea that's waving to you and me by the side of the sea. Quick sand and tide. Watch the mussels, the oysters, and the clams when you live by the side of the sea. See the fish nibbling on your lawn when you live by the side of the sea. Seagulls on your roof, seagulls in your pram when you live by the side of the sea. Wheeling gannets, incessantly crying gulls when you live by the side of the sea. There's a time of day when you can talk to a wave when you live by the sea. You can hear its words in the whispering spray when you live by the side of the sea. The tales it tells of the storms and swells. Things you can hear, but you never can tell when you live by the side of the sea. I've got to do another couple of verses, because you wrote them. Yeah. You can splash and play as boundless as can be when you live by the side of the sea. Listen to the mud, find the bottles in the bay when you live by the side of the sea. Wander in the brine, have the boaty fun when you live by the side of the sea. You can swim when you can, if you're me, when you live by the side of the sea. Reclaimed land in our crowded town when you live by the side of the sea. Polluted smells of dead fish when you live by the side of the sea. So in Hong Kong at the moment, it's hell. It's hell. I've worked in Hong Kong for 15 years and we're seeing the political crisis in Hong Kong and people's lives being destroyed by that, by the Chinese government. It's horrific, sorry. Live in high buildings that touch the sky when you live by the side of the sea. Sometimes salty, gentle breeze when you live by the side of the sea. Quick sand and time.
Thank you. That's a pleasure. That was a lovely. I've, you know, I could probably sing for an hour of songs about the tide because when you live somewhere like this, that's all you write about is your relationship to the sea and the tide and the water and all of the things around it. I'm not going to sing for an hour. That was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, a great it's been amazing great great day um, interesting a whole load of stuff it'd be fascinating to see the archive of it and to see the collection of links that you make out of it um, and come and go and have a look at the Tide and Time um, website I'll put the, the link into the um, into the chat in a minute um, and thank you for joining me that was delightful thank you